In today's show, it's time for another ADP battle. This time with Alex Reclean of Rotowire. Michael, Michael Bolton. Are you there, Michael? Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast your first listen every day free, available on all platforms. We are to- doing ADP battles with Alex Reclean today. There'll be a second one coming later today as well and then a third coming tomorrow. So be, uh, be on the lookout for all of those. Before we get into talking to Alex with his ADP battle, an opportunity for the Locked On Fantasy Championship Roto League brought to you by... The guys over at Trace and Chase. Trace and Chase are providing the prize, which is memorabilia. Uh, they are a sports card trading store located in Greece. They've got some great great stuff there. If you are living in Greece, of course, there's some great stuff for you to go see in store, but they also ship worldwide trading cards and uh, memorabilia. And they're providing like a framed, um, framed display of trading cards for the winning team of the players who are in that winning team at the end of this league. So if you want in this league, it's a $50 entry as well. $600 winner take all. Roto League, 20 players per team. 12 team league, um, uh, 11 category Roto format with an auction salary draft on Monday, 18th of October at 7 p.m. Eastern. So if you want in that, what you need to do is you need to find the tweet that I promote this show on. You need to reply to it with the first place that paid me to write about fantasy basketball. Where was my first employment in fantasy basketball? Who paid me to do that for the first time? Just reply that in the comments down below. Now let's get in. Let's bring Alex in and let's talk. Uh, let's talk some ADPs and let's have some. Uh, let's have some battles. All right, let's bring him in now. Back for another year of ADP battles. It is Alex Reclean. Alex, welcome back. Great. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's good to be here. This, this is always a fun uh, fun little thing we get to do together. So if people haven't seen these ADP battles before, what we're doing is just so I'm picking sort of a random number, random draft spot, and we're just debating the merits of two players at each spot. Now, of course, this doesn't take into consideration that sometimes some of these players will have um, you know, drafting hype that goes earlier or goes lower, and you go, well, I could actually get this guy at a lower spot if I waited because other people won't be picking him here. We're just looking at two players here, you know, gun to your head, which I hope never happens in anyone's fantasy draft that people are going around with guns saying pick a player but if that's our hypothetical here who would you choose out of these two guys alex i think i described that okay didn't i yeah i think i think you nailed it so don't kill us too much about these ones let's let's go on to the uh the first one we're going to talk about here we're sitting there we're sitting at the start of round two alex pick 14 or roundabouts paul george hasn't been picked in the first round maga porter jr is still available as well at number 14 alex you are doing what I'm going Michael Porter Jr., although the news that Michael Porter Jr. is unvaccinated makes this a really, really close call for me. Um, So before we got that news, I had I was I felt a little bit more confident. But now I'm a little bit worried uh, about a couple extra missed games, maybe for MPJ. And I have this I have this neck and neck. But um, but yeah, I, I do have Porter Jr. above above Paul George. Why is that? Like, obviously, there's no Jamal Murray. We know that Mm -hmm. for you know basically the whole season. So we are expecting Porter's usage to rise. But yeah, I I, my issue. I think Porter's fine if you want to take him end of second round. I've got no problem with taking him there at all. My issue is with him is when, when I look at guys and he falls into this category for me who have numbers which feel unsustainable, like you know shooting 45 or 46 percent from three or whatever it was he did last season, plus his historical lack of assist steals and blocks. I worry that I don't think those things come up and then I'm not sure that he can maintain being like that 45% three-point shooter. He might be a 40% three-point shooter, which is still really good, or even 41%, but that's still a significant drop-off, which hurts his threes, his points, and his overall field goal percentage. So what are you expecting him to improve on from this season versus last? 
Well, so uh, one of the starting points for me is I basically threw out all of uh, everything before Jamal Murray got hurt. And yep. since Jamal Murray got hurt, uh, if I was better, you know, I, I don't have it directly in front of me off the top of my head. If I recall correctly, it was something like 24.5 points, uh, eight rebounds. Um, it, his numbers were very, very good after Jamal Murray was out. Uh, and I was very impressed by that. And I liked, I liked that. Um, I agree the shooting numbers are probably unsustainable from how good they were, but I do think that 50 plus percent from the field and better than 40% from behind the arc is kind of what I'm expecting. I think that's a, a almost conservative projection as good as that is. That's how good I think he is as a shooter and, and how much I'm impressed by him. Um, I do think that usage rate, as you said, comes up. I think that the, I think that, um, that therefore with that increase comes an increase in field goal percentage. And I agree that there's not a ton of upward mobility on the defensive stats, but I think there is a little bit. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that I, th I don't see why he can't get to at least a full block a game instead of, you know, the 0 0.8, 0 0.9 that he was dealing with last year. Well, I've got his numbers after Murray went down. He mm -hmm. um, had a usage of 24% in that in that, uh, that time. Actually, that's still not coming up correctly. Something's going on with my numbers here. Because he, Murray hurt his uh, knee at the start. Here we go. Got it. All right. So his usage was 24%. Yeah. He averaged yeah. 23 and a half points with four threes, six rebounds. That came on 49% three-point shooting. Um, and 56% yep. from the field. So there's going to be a, a drop in that. So he's not going to hit four threes. He's not going to shoot 49% from three. He averaged 0.7 steals, 0.8 blocks, and, and 1.5 assists, which is basically the same numbers that he did all season. And yeah, yep. up to 24 points per game, which is all, yeah, they're all good numbers. But I, I just think looking at that, which is a, 20, a 17 game sample, there's just mm -hmm. no way that that shooting has any chance of being able to stick. Now, maybe the usage can push up from 24. I think that's, that's a possibility. Like maybe he goes to 25 yeah. or 26 for the season. I just think there's just a lack in those other areas. And I'm just worried a bit about the shooting numbers. But on Paul George, I look at George as, again, in a situation to like Porter where he's going to see an increased usage because the other star on his yep. team has a, a torn ACL and is not going to play this season. So we're going to see George jump up. Now, George has way higher upside in the steals category. I don't think he goes back to being that 1.8 or whatever he was when he played for Oklahoma yeah. City, which pushed him to a top five player. But to me, if I look at those two, I go, well, which one of these two here I feel like has got a safer floor? But also, if Paul George does average two steals, then he is a top five player. And I just don't think Porter's actually ever got that in him to push into that first round discussion. It's totally fair. Um, I think that I am a little bit worried about... Part of why I'm a little hesitant on Paul George is I am a little bit concerned about just his health. Um, you enough. know, we, we had this conversation last yeah. year um, and his, his health issues have been a little bit overstated, I think by the community at large, but the load on him this year is going to be higher. Um, and whether that results in more load, load management or an increased propensity for missing games, that is something that um, pull, pulls me back a little bit on him. We'll get on to the next one in just a sec, but if you are looking to start a fantasy basketball league for this season and you bring in people at work who may not know much about fantasy hoops or the NBA or, or friends from school, Sleeper might be the app that you want to try. They are a points-only fantasy league that has their exclusive game pick format where it's just one game per week. So you've got to pick which game your player plays for the week. Their app is very, very easy to use. It is a beautiful interface. The draft room is great. They uh, handle third round reversal drafts. They do dynasty. They do keeper leagues. It is a great app to get in for people who are transitioning across from fantasy football and are familiar with the fantasy football scoring system. Sleep Up might be the app that you want to try. So if you're trying something new and you want to get new people involved, go and start a new league over on the Sleeper app. All right, Alex, let's go on to the next one now. Who have we got up here? We're looking, we're going down to the back end of the second round. And he talked unvaccinated players already with Michael Porter Jr. And I guess part of my worry, just to touch on that quickly, part of my worry with that, and I've said it a few times, is that if Denver institutes a policy like LA, San Francisco, New York, yeah. where unvaccinated players can't play home games, then that yeah bites you in the ass. And the same thing could happen in DC. So we're at pick 25, Bradley Bill and Devin Booker. Now, we say this pick 25, 
Bradley Beal is not going to last to pick 25 in most spots. His ADP is like 15 on Yahoo, and it is pushing back a little bit on certain on certain sites. It is pushing back a little bit, but I wanted to illustrate this one here because when I looked at your numbers and I looked at my rankings, these guys were wildly different. So I just thought, let's split the middle here. Now, I would take Beal well ahead of this, um, but you would have the guy I haven't mentioned, Devin Booker. We're debating these two here at pick 25. So the, the idea of the exercise is if you're forced to choose between these two guys, and you're probably not going to be because Beal's going to be off the board here. But let's say we've probably. got these two these two players. You're taking Booker ahead of Beal? Yeah, so um, Booker is, for me, the last guy who I actually would take above Beal, um, which I think is is a use, useful that you chose him for this exercise. And I just want to be totally clear. I think Bradley Beal is going to have a better fantasy season than Devin Booker. A hundred percent. Please don't make me argue the contrary. I don't believe it. Um, but fantasy basketball is supposed to be fun. And I was so upset by and like angry and frustrated by Bradley Beal's comments and, and what he has been doing related to vaccination. And if, if that doesn't bother you, great, good for you. But that bothers me. And his role in the NFL, in the um, NBA Players Association means He's a big part of the pushback, which is that is preventing players from being required to have a vaccine while every other personnel, every other employee who works in these stadiums is vaccinated. Um, I, it frustrates me, it boggles my mind, and it makes me angry, and I don't want to have to root for him. And Devin Booker is... I think really good. I think if Devin Booker is there at 25, I do think that that's kind of a slam dunk pick for me. Um, and, you know, if Booker's off the board at that point, then I'm going to get Beal and try to trade him as quickly as I can, because at some point you also want to win and you got to just get the value where you can. But I, this is supposed to be fun. Rooting for Bradley Beal right now is not going to be fun for me. There is still that risk with Beal as well that DC does institute that yeah, yeah, indoor absolutely. policy. Look, that, that, that's that's for sure a risk. Now, I think that you know, in the past two years ago, before Chris Paul arrived in Phoenix, it just strictly on their merits, you could have easily argued um, Booker yeah. over Beal. Like Booker was a fringe first round player, and Beal was in that fringe zone as well. Of course, yeah, Booker dropped way off last season. Like his assist numbers are almost cut in half. His free throw numbers weren't as good, and he fell way way off. That stuff can bounce back, especially the free throw shooting. The assists, I'm not yep. so certain. But if Chris Paul does suffer an injury, then Booker's numbers are going to jump. They're going to jump up pretty significantly because he's going to handle the ball. Um, he's going to get more assists anyway. You know, campaign will, will play there, but he's not. Campaign's not Chris Paul, quite obviously. No. So there is scope yeah. for Booker to, Booker to jump up, but you know, with the way that things currently sit, like you, you're taking those risks on board, and I can understand. That, like you're worried about Bill. He might miss time. You're thinking maybe Paul does miss time. Booker can jump up, and yes, you, and, and and you're annoyed at Bradley Beal. And I, I understand yeah. that. Uh, that's that point of view as well. Let's go on to the next one here, Alex. Let's go to pick 36. So again, end of the third round here. Now, this one to me again, it's one I highlight. In most cases, Lamelo Ball is not going to be available there. I think he's getting drafted about 31 or 32 in most. Most cases, uh, 27 actually is his Yahoo uh, ADP at the moment. So he's gone a little bit early in this. And CJ McCollum yeah. goes later than this. But I, I saw this and it, it stood out to me in your in your numbers as well. So I wanted to get your take on, um, yeah, CJ's ADP is 51. So again, if we're in a draft, you don't have to take CJ here. You can wait another round. You can get him later on. That's not the that's not the purpose of this exercise for us to say that you're reaching up at 36 and, right. p- and picking CJ. But you do have him in your ranks ahead yeah. of Lamelo Ball. So why is that? I, I think, um, and I feel like, I don't know if this was last year or another year. I feel this is another conversation that we've maybe had. I think we've I'm talked little, CJ before on, on these. Oh, shows. we've definitely had CJ. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm always a little worried about um, assuming too much growth in a player. Yeah, LaMelo Ball is great. He's fun to root for. He looks like a future star. I If you told me that he is going to be uh, you know, first round or mid second round player in a couple of years, I'd say, yep, I totally see it. But as a rookie, he was still 56th um, in eight cat over the course of the season. And he was worse after the all-star break. Yep. Um, and so there is, I, you know, the question is just how high are we willing, how much jump are we willing to expect from someone who the, the talking point all last year was, he looks so poised. He looks so comfortable. 
So we're not talking about, you know, a rookie shaking off the rust that we normally see with, with a lot of rookies. He, he kind of never had that, that, that development problem in the first place. And so assuming that he jumps 30 spots in the ranking makes me a little worried. I absolutely think he's going to do better than 56, but, um, but getting him all, all the way up to the mid twenties, just, I, I think that we might be jumping the gun there. Yeah, I understand that completely because sometimes you, know, you do get guys that stall a little bit in that second year as well. That, that can happen. But you know, last year, CJ McCollum ranked higher than LaMelo Ball on a per-game basis. So this is not... like People will be looking at this going, oh, Alex, what are you talking about? It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> idiot. Oh, fucking idiot. But <laughs> CJ ranked higher than him like last year. There's yeah. there's no debate about that. that. That That is what happened. My argument against that is LaMelo Ball played 29 minutes. And he's not playing yeah. twenty. He's not playing twenty nine minutes again this year. But a point you bring up is interesting. When he started, his assist numbers dropped. Right, mm-hmm. he they were great off the bench, but in a starting lineup they dropped. And I think his efficiency also dropped a little bit in that starting lineup. Now I'm not sure that, whether that means anything or not. But the assist rate is very interesting because Gordon Haywood, Terry Rozier, they get the ball in their hands a little bit. Yep. So there is something. There is something to that that I discussed when I did my Hornet season preview show. Hayward's a great year. passer. Yeah. Yeah, and and that it, it was a little a, a thing starting versus coming off the bench. There was a large discrepancy for Lamelo uh, in those assist numbers, which is something just to keep in mind that it's not just well going to twenty nine to thirty four minutes that the assists just jump up that exact same ratio because they may not right. because last season in that role it just didn't happen that way. I, I would still take. Lamelo over CJ because I value those assists pretty highly. I do think there is going to be some growth, and I'm just looking at it and going. Well, I think 29 minutes goes to 34 minutes, so just that extra volume, and yeah. they're only they're only separated by five or six spots last year anyway. I think that pushes him ahead there anyway. And but you're right, taking him at look, he's 80 pound ESPN is 24 Lamelo, and it's 27 on Yahoo, and that might actually be not right. That might be a complete bust situation. Or as you said, he could end up as the 15th best player, whether it's this year or in two years' time. There is right. Distinct possibility. Wouldn't be surprising. I'm no. just, I'm not ready to go all the way there right now. And just to say a minute on CJ, uh, I, I, the way he came out of the gate last year before oh, he yeah. got hurt was so good. And if we're talking about a pick, I think that, you know, we're talking about in the late 30s, CJ's often around in the 40s. I we're the talking 50s. about a, yeah, okay, even better. Um, we're talking about if he can do, even just you know ninety percent of where the way he came out of the gate last year, that is a home run of a pick. Um, so, so just to say something positive about CJ. Also, if people are watching this on YouTube, I'm sorry I keep itching. I'm covered in poison ivy. I was doing a bunch of yard work the other day. <laughs> so sorry, YouTube people. No, uh, no nervous scratching. It's a, it's, it's a medical condition that Alex, uh, <laughs> Alex is going through here. Um, just on the Lamelo Ball assist numbers, I've just pulled them up. As a reserve last year, he was eight point seven per thirty six assists, seven point one as a starter. That's not insignificant. We'll, we'll see what that, what that happens there. And I think he actually, no, I said he's true shooting. Uh, decrease. It actually got better. So I went from 53 to 55. So I was incorrect on that one. Um, but yeah, his, uh, his assist rate dropped. He averaged the same assists in six fuel minutes as a as a bench player versus a starter. So you can take that um, take that information on. Would you argue, last point of this one, would you agree though that the upside for these two guys, Lamelo, has the higher upside for this season? Yes. Yes. Yep. But probably there is that riskiness of that floor. I think that, and I understand that point as well. All right, guys. Football is back and it is time for you to put all of your betting action on the gridiron over at Bet Online. It is the best place to put all of your your bets with the updated site and improved interface, more odds, more props, more contests. Bet Online continues to be the number one source for everything football. And if you head to the website or the your usual mobile device and sign up today, you can use our promo code locked on and get a 50% welcome bonus just for signing up. Simple as that. From football, basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait. Take advantage of everything they have to offer for the 2021 season. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. BetOnline is where the game starts. And then, of course, Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. If you're looking for a protein bar and you don't want it to taste like something that you scraped off the bottom of your shoe, Built Bar is the answer. It tastes just like a candy bar, whether that's the raspberry flavor, the cookies and cream, the salted caramel, the mint brownie, one of their special edition flavors like the uh, grasshopper cookie or lemon almond cheesecake. These flavors taste amazing, but they're not just delicious. They're also good for you. 17 to 18 grams of protein. Four to five grams of sugar, four to five grams of net carbs, and 130 to 180 calories per bar. And... Delicious and healthy and save money. 
15% off by going to built.com by using our promo code LOCKED15. So load up your cart, chuck the boxes in there, use the promo code LOCKED15 when you're ready to check out and you will save that money. Head to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. Let's taste this next ADP battle, Alex. We are looking... Now, uh, we've gone back to the uh, middle of the second round, end, start, of, start of the third round. Not middle of the second round, sorry. End of the second round, start of the third round. A couple of big blokes. We're going Phoenix again. We've got DeAndre Ayton, and we've got Julius Randle. Much like Devin Booker, um, DeAndre Ayton you know, disappointed last season, dropped probably 20, 30 spots from his previous season yep. ranking. Whereas Julius Randle did the opposite from a guy that every Knicks fan hated and wanted to be traded immediately. Now he's their savior and the greatest thing in the world and you know, putting up these fantastic numbers. I do agree that Ayton will improve this year. I also think that Randle will regress mainly because there just will be, the ball won't be in his hands as much as I will, one of my constant things that I'll say on this show, when you go from Alfred Payton to Kemba Walker and Reggie Bullock to Evan <laughs> Fournier, like there's a little bit of a talent upgrade, a little bit of a shooting upgrade, offensive players upgrade, everything there upgrade. So Randall doesn't need to do literally everything. He might still try it, and he's going to play a shit ton of minutes because Obi Toppin's not cutting into that. But just if you lose two percentage points on your usage, if you lose yeah, an assist, then it does drop him down. I still have Randall ahead of Aiden, but I do agree that they are probably moving in opposite directions this season. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, a couple words on Aiton is I think that what we saw from him in the playoffs was sort of the jump that we were hoping he was going to make during last season. And I'm hoping that that sort of confidence and, and him having done that on a harder stage, he'll be able to carry that in through the season. Um, and as you said, he was even better in his rookie and sophomore year than he was last year. And so I think that he gets at least back to that, if not higher. Um, he was 30, uh, 32nd and 33rd as a in nine cat as a rookie and as a sophomore. I don't remember his eight cat off the top of my head, but um, he, you know, a very good producer in, in both of those. Um, so I'm expecting him to get back up to, you know, in the late twenties of ranks. I think that you're underselling how much Julius Randle is going to um, fall off. It's possible. Um, I think that his, you know, his assist rate or his assists per game doubled last year. It, it, like, I just don't understand how when you replace, as you just said, um, Bullock and Peyton with Fournier and, and Kemba, I don't understand how he possibly doesn't have that fallback definitely below five and probably below four. His career high before last year was 3.1. Um, his, his points were a career high. Um, his free throw percentage was a career high by almost 10 percentage points. Um, his three point shooting was a career high by eight or nine percentage points. I just think that he can still be good he can still be, you know, a great player on the Knicks who does good things and have a massive, massive fall off from last year. There is room for both of those things to be true. Um, and I would not take him in the 30s. I'm not taking him if that first number is a three. You know, so you would wait till the 40s for Julius Randle? Yes. If, uh, yes. That you will, now everything you said is true there. I, I do have him projected for under five assists per game uh, this season. He was over six last year. Um, uh, he, it could go under four. He was at 3.1 in the previous season because they were running him basically as a point guard and they're just not going to yeah. do that as much this season. And you're right, when you see those huge spikes, there is always room for regression. Now, maybe it becomes like Brandon Ingram where they take these big step up in um, uh, yeah, free throw percentage and three point percentage and it sticks and that's the new norm. That is possible. That'd be great. <laughs> that, that, that is possible. I think my more thing of going with Randall is that I, I feel, I don't feel that, that Aiton, while we, we can look at what he did in the playoffs and, and the general narrative is he was so great, but he only averaged 16 and 12. It wasn't a gigantic, gigantic step up from him in the regular season. One point on Aiton, he's only played 31 minutes a game. Yeah, that could easily go back to 33, 34. Yeah. But what, what is Phoenix thinking about this guy? This is, you know, they're not offering him this max extension on the contract. And then Monty Williams the other day is like, we want Mikhail Bridges to be our third offensive option. What does that put? Where does that put Aiton? It's like the front office doesn't value you. Now the coach is saying, well, you're just an, a nothing offensive option. That worries me a little bit. I get that. Um, I totally get that. Uh, I The stats did get a little bit better during the playoffs, but what 
I like about the playoffs more than the stats is just the level of impact and, yeah. and the confidence. Uh, you know, I think I used that word already, but um, he, he was back to being an important player on the Suns. And even if some of the messaging from the coaching staff and the, the team management has gone against that, um, you know, everything we heard about his relationship with Chris Paul and, and his demeanor on the court and, and how that transitioned, that gives me confidence that, you know, he can bring some of that forward. Plus, I, as you said, a couple extra minutes a game would be really helpful uh, and definitely in play. You know, hard, hard to know exactly if that will happen. The last one here, this is a, this is going to be a yearly staple for us, <laughs> Alex. It is the, uh, the annual Let's Talk About Al Horford section of the show. We are at, we're at, pick, we're at pick 70. I'm, I'm going to throw this one out there. I'll throw it up on the board now. Pick 70. <laughs> now, again, you under no circumstance. Correct. You agree with me, Al? You are, you are under no circumstance picking Al Horford at pick 70 because there is no, no one in the world who is, who is putting him in this area. Correct. I absolutely agree with you with Al Horford that he is getting undervalued and he is still really, really good. And... You know, I've been banging this drum a lot, and people have, you know, people. Oh, he's just gonna, he's just gonna sit back to backs. He's not gonna play. That's not the case, and that actually came out today that they announced right. that that this is this is not a situation where he's in Oklahoma City. He might get hurt, mm-hmm. but he is not yeah. on it. And people again, I, I I find this frustrating as well. People just think, well, everyone's just gonna sit every game. They're just everyone's. <laughs> it's just not happening. I reckon there's two guys who come into this season with a set plan. I reckon Mike Conley's one of them. I think John Isaac is the other one outside of the guys who come back when Clay re- returns and those sort of people that come back with those set things. But in terms of if if Isaac, and there was a weird report on Isaac today saying that he thinks he's ready for the opener, but he's thinking maybe more Christmas, which is 16 months after an ACL injury, which is insanity to me. So it doesn't look like he's going to be ready to start the season. That's another thing. So let's go. I haven't even mentioned who I'm taking a pick 70. I know you hate rookies. Yep. And, you, and you won't take any rookies inside the top 100. So I could have put this at pick 90 and you would have still had the same answer. Um, Cade Cunningham or Al Horford? Sell me on Al Horford. All right. So actually, I'm really unimpressed with the range of like 80 to 90 this year. And so I am willing it's weird, to isn't it? go a little bit higher for a rookie this year than normal. But generally speaking, I hate rookies in, in the double digit uh, picks. Al Horford. Um, I think he's back in the place that loves him and where he was last really effective. Um, and so I like that sort of emotional, important boost. Um, it's important to remember that when he played last year, he was impactful. Um, yeah, it's great. You know, he, he was, uh, his per game ranks were 60th in nine cat. And uh, I think I have this right here. Uh, and 74th and 8 cat. And mm-hmm. that was only in 28 minutes per game. Yep. Uh, now that he's on a team that is trying to win and with a organization that is familiar with him, I, I think that 28 minutes per game is a reasonable expectation. It could go a little higher. It could go a little lower. But I think that that's, I, I think that that's a, a sort of pretty uh, median estimate, yeah, right? I've got, him at, 20, I've got him at 28, yeah. 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 Um, so we know that he can produce at that. He's not going to be resting half the season. They're mm-hmm. in a really competitive Eastern Conference race for home field advantage in the playoffs. Or, I mean, the race even to avoid the play-in game in the East is going to be kind of heated. Yeah. Um, and I love big men who can pass. Um, and that's something that always will boost. You know, if I expect someone to fit, if I expect a big man to finish. 85th in per game ranks, but he can average two and a half assists a game. I'm not taking him at 85th. I'm taking him a little bit earlier just because assists are so hard to come by, especially that late in the draft. Um, and Al Horford has always been a great passer. So he gets that added boost. He, he averaged, he'll average more than two, uh, two and a half. Like he will go over three. For oh sure. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, he he, hasn't he got... averaged two and a half since, uh, you know, and 2013 was last time he averaged the, that little. The Celtics don't have great passes. Like Jason Tatum is a guy where you go, well, maybe he can become an okay passer. Jalen Brown's not a good passer. Marcus Smart's a pretty good passer. Dennis Schroeder is not a good passer. Josh Richardson is a terrible passer. Robert Williams <laughs> is an okay passer. But literally, like, it's leaning more towards Horford starting. It appears, and I'll talk about Caden in a sec. It's leaning more towards Horford starting. I agree with the 28-minute assessment. I think that he is getting underdrafted nearly everywhere, and the top 100 is absolutely in play. I don't think he has the same usage that he had 
You know, KC, where he was at over 20%. Sure. 21, 22. I think that comes down pretty considerably. But, you know, four assists is possible. 12 points is possible. Six rebounds, a block. Two threes. Like, all this is pretty... It is pretty achievable. I, I just... Yeah, you know, I, I would... I, I agree that Horford's undervalued. I would just take Cade ahead of him. I just think that Cade has the legitimate ability, and I'm you know, I'm never going to do this either. I'm not taking him in the top 50, but some rookies do finish in that area. Look, we just talked about Lamelo Ball, yeah. who's not the prospect that Cade is. He finished 55th or whatever it was. Cade could average 18, 5, and 6 with 1.5 steals, hit two and a half threes, hit 80% from the line, and then, you know, the... the the matchup here is cooked, but he might not. Like maybe he struggles, yeah. and, he, and he probably struggles early on. That that's a, that's a possibility there as well. And this just again ties into your philosophies. Like I'm not overreaching on on rookies. I'm not taking that. And yeah. We're going to talk about rookies and some of these other ADP battles coming up on in the next couple of days with other guys. Yeah. You just have I a just, you have a, a set I, philosophy and you stick to it, which is fine. And uh, you know, I, I've I've got I've done the research. Yeah, if you want, I can link you to the last time I did a, an article on it. I, I might re-up it this year. Um, I I just think that the I think that taking a rookie that early is a bad bet, and I think that taking a, a rookie late in drafts is a great bet. Uh, so give me all the Shen Gun shares, and you can have Cade. One thing I just want to throw out there: Why are you so confident that? Cade is going to have a better season than Jalen Green. There's a big de- gap in them on ADP, and I'm not getting either of them. But if you asked me to pick a rookie, I think I'd rather Jalen this year. Okay, um, I'll ask you that why in a second. Why would I take Cade? Um, I think he can contribute in more areas. I think he can be a better rebounder. I think he's going to average maybe double the assists that, that Jalen does. I think that's probably the, the, the major factor. For me, there, I think he'll probably get more steals. Um, I think that he is, a, I think he'll probably average a better three point percentage, therefore, better field goal percentage overall. I just think he's got a more well rounded overall game. Whereas, I think Jalen will go out there and he'll chuck a lot of shots for sure. It might come at like legitimately 38% shooting for the first two, three months <laughs> of the season and then push up very. You know, Anthony Edwards was 47% true shooting for the first 36 games of last year and then yeah, 57% exactly. for the last 36. And a similar trajectory for Jalen Green would not be a surprise. Um, I'm not sure if Jalen brings the same you know, defensive steal rate that what Anthony Edwards did. I'm not sure that that's going to necessarily um, happen with him there. So I'm, I'm a little bit worried that he'll get too shot happy and won't be reined in as much in terms of taking good shots, and that's just going to kill the overall um, the overall efficiency that he brings. And then I'm not sure he makes that up with good rebound numbers or, go, or good assist numbers or where the steals lie. So that's I just think Cade's got a little bit of a safety net there that if the shooting's not quite there initially, there are other areas where he can bring it. Um, I also think, I actually think Cade's actually a better shooter than Jalen Green as well um, in terms of difficulty of shots and pull-ups and, and working catch and shoot and off the dribble, all that sort of stuff. I actually think he's a better shooter than him too. The thing with me is the Rockets know who they are this year and mm. they are a bad team that wants to give as many minutes to their young potential stars as possible. And I'm not sure the Pistons are as self-aware and I'm, af- I am afraid that, you know, I'm, af- I think that there's a reasonable shot that Jalen Green is playing 33 plus minutes a game yep. and Cade is spending several months in the 25 to 28 minutes a game range. By the end of the season, I absolutely think Cade will be playing more than that. But I think that there's a reasonable chance that he maybe, maybe 25 is too low, but, but that he's playing less minutes and that they are deluding themselves into thinking they're a competitive team and not giving him sort of the free reign to compile some of those stats that Jalen Green will have from day one. And that's one of the things that makes me not necessarily say that I like, I'm not a hundred percent on Jalen Green. I, I just, I think it should be a lot closer than it is, but you don't, I'm not spending energy parsing this one because both of them are off the board before it comes to me. Um, <laughs> couple of things that you've said here it's back on that section here so the 80s to 90s is a bit weird like i did a show on that yesterday and like in that round eight round nine zone like it's pretty weird like it's just there's no real super value guys standing out it no. is a it is a weird zone in the draft so i do agree with you there um I, with the cage stuff I, I do agree that there is a chance that the pistons delude themselves into thinking they're better than they are but 
I think that the way that they would delude themselves into thinking that they're better than they are is because Cade's played 32 minutes and taken them to that level. I don't see okay. uh, I don't see Corey Joseph and Jeremy Grant making them go, oh shit, we're going to make the play in. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't, I think if they're going to push to that level, it's because Cade has actually played well, and therefore then maybe he gets more minutes and more responsibility. But I can easily see Dwayne Casey doing some dickhead thing like playing Corey Joseph and playing Cade off ball and having him stand in the corner playing 30 minutes a night and getting five shots a game or something ridiculous like that. Of course, the problem, not the problem, is the thing is that the, you've got Killian Hayes and Cade Cunningham there. And if one of those is going to be sacrificed for the steady veteran who's not actually very good in Corey Joseph, it's probably going to be Killian and not Cade Cunningham. But there is a risk. Dwayne Casey is definitely a risk. And I can understand where you're coming from. Alex. I reckon we'll, uh, we'll wrap that up there. Um, tell people where they can find you and any articles or anything that you want to promote. Yeah. Um, Twitter, at Rick Lean, my last name, R-I-K-L-E-E-N. Uh, most of my stuff's on Rotowire. Had an article the other day where I touched on a couple of these players, um, at least Julius Randle, uh, on, you know, AD, ADP surprises. Um, just, you know, follow me on Twitter. I'll tweet out stuff there. Go follow Alex over on his Twitter. Check out his article as well. Alex, thanks for coming back on and uh, doing this with me again. It's always a blast. And that will do it for today's show. Just remember with these these ADP battle shows that we do, like the guests that come on, they, I, I and as I will say this a million times, I am not right 100% of the time. It's impossible to be. So, yeah, oh, this guy, he's trash. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Whether you say it to me or whether you say it to the guests, it's not really necessary. So we go on here just to have a bit of fun, to have a chat about these players, discuss where things can and can't go wrong and why things may happen in certain ways. I have my opinions, they have their opinions, but I can obviously see the rationale behind all of these things that happen. So, guys, leave a comment down below. Give it a thumbs up. If you are uh, following the audio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Odyssey, subscribe. Follow, actually, follow is the right word, and you'll never miss an episode, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.